Hi everybody, my name is Brady and I'm a 19th century American historian. We are back with another React video and today we're going to be doing more extra history. So I had to decide which extra history series I was going to do next and I decided to go with Sengoku Jidai. I chose that for two kind of immature reasons. One of them is, a, I guess, an okay reason because it's so far out of my comfort zone that I'm almost guaranteed to learn something because it, it really, I, I don't know anything about Eastern history, Japanese history. I didn't even know if Sengoku was a person or a, a period or like a larger entity encompassing many people. And the other one is because I know this term Sengoku from... Uh, the One Piece anime. There is a character uh, with that name. I, I, I don't know if there's any relation there or anything that could be revealed to me about the One Piece anime uh, from this, but it, it's just something that kind of caught my eye because I always thought that character was really cool. <laughs> it, it's stupid. All right. But yeah, I, I'm excited to learn a little bit about this. This video, the full title is Warring States Japan Sengoku, Sengaku, uh, Jidai, Battle of... Okihazama, this is already a nightmare, extra history number one. I may have done a little editorializing uh, during the reading of that title. Okay, uh, so let me just make sure the volume is going to be all set. I I'm, I'm excited to see what's in this one. So we'll see where we go from here and let me know in the comments which extra history videos you want me to check out next. A, a lot of you have been... Uh, Otto von Bismarck is that is that the one that that's the one I've been getting a lot of suggestions for maybe I'll do that one next maybe I'll do a poll I gotta get a few suggestions to throw in that poll so let me know in the comment section below now let's get started Sengoku Jidai the warring states period the time we think of when we think of samurai a time of self-sacrifice bravery treachery and betrayal a time when the fate of great clans could turn in a day, and peasants could rise up to become regent of all Japan. A time filled mm. with personalities like Miyamoto Musashi, Oda Nobunaga, Hattori Hanzo, and of course, Tokugawa Ieyasu. Okay, these names are going to be a little bit difficult for me. I, it's definitely If I end up mixing people up, please forgive me. Uh, I did learn a little bit about Japan during, I think it was probably the Bill Words video that taught me a little bit about really how chaotic things could be at times, but uh, that's really just a general vibe rather than a, a anything specific. So we'll see what we can get into with this, but I'm down with the chaos. That's exciting. Names that live on in our culture even today. It's one of the most seminal periods in Japanese history, and it'll be the topic of our next few videos. In 1467, a few decades before Columbus stumbled onto the shores of the Bahamas, and 15 years after the light of Rome was extinguished for the last time at the fall of Constantinople, Japan erupted into a great civil war. This war, oh. the Onin War, rocked all of Japan. It started as a dynastic dispute between two great clans, the Hosokawa and the Yamana, but it soon spiraled out of their control, devastating both of these clans and shattering any semblance of unity within Japan. As central authority collapsed, regional warlords called daimyo fought to assert their power over whatever portion of the country they could grab. Okay, so this is a, a classic case of uh, destabilization and then different entities are going to come in to fill the vacuum. And this sorts of revolutionary change is bound to happen during periods of immense chaos here. You could either have complete order, one side wins over entirely, but if they devastate each other, there's so much room for people to hop in, establish their own things, and if nobody is really organized on the level where they can rule over them all, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that makes sense. Fracturing Japan into a hundred feuding fiefdoms and plunging the whole country into chaos and a hundred years of ceaseless war. But we're going to pick up the story in the province of Mikawa, the home of the Matsudaira, in 1548. This province and this whole region is central to our story, because Kyoto, the capital of Japan at the time, and traditionally the home of the emperor and the shogun, is just a short distance away. And whoever controls the shogun, at least in theory, controls Japan. But in Mikawa, the Matsudaira are surrounded by two larger, much more powerful clans, the Oda to the west and the Imigawa to the east. 
It was just a matter of time until one of these larger clans attacked the Matsudaira, looking to claim their territory in this age of might makes right. 1548 is that year. The Oda forces start marching into Matsudaira territory. The defenses collapse. Without help, the Matsudaira are clearly lost, so the head of the Matsudaira clan turns to the Imagawa. He asks them for an alliance, mm. for help to defend his lands, but an alliance won't come without a price. The Imagawa clan offer to help on the condition that he send them his eldest son as a hostage. Having little other choice, the head of the Matsudaira family agrees. That's a that's big right there. And this is this is weird because this is not the type of thing that I would expect as somebody who comes from like western history to send your son away as a hostage in order to secure an alliance just culturally that feels so much different from stuff that I've uh, seen in western history i i get it though like it totally makes sense just it's not something i would necessarily ever consider happening so this is already kind of a a shock to my senses if this is something that's happened more in western history than i'm aware then i'm just not aware but that that's actually kind of fascinating but as his retainers are taking his son to the Imagawa territory, they're ambushed. Somebody oh. tipped off the Oda. The boy is kidnapped and spirited away to Oda lands. The Oda write to the Matsudaira and tell them that if they don't turn traitor and end their alliance with the Imagawa, they'll kill the boy. And here's where the head of the Matsudaira pulls one of the most brilliant maneuvers of the Sengoku Jidai. Now, I don't know if he did it as a brilliant stratagem or if he was just doing it out of stoic samurai bravado, but still, brilliant. He writes back and says to them something roughly like, Kill my son. In doing so, you will show the Imagawa just how committed to our alliance I am. Wanna catch 22. Don't kill my son, I win. Kill my son, I win more. And boy does it work. The Oda don't kill the boy. In fact, they have no idea what to do with him now. So it makes me wonder, like, uh, it's very possible that a big leader or whatever values, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I'm, I'm losing my voice right now. Uh, some great leader might value their their land more than their family. It's very possible that it could be happening. Or this is a bluff, and it's a bluff that happened to work out. It was a calculated bluff, and he really understood how to frame the argument effectively because I guess he, he, he won on both sides of that. So that that's actually... Uh, it's pretty badass. A big risk there, because somebody could easily just call his bluff there, but I guess all that really matters to them is that the alliance is weakened. It, it doesn't... The sun really isn't that big of a deal. If the sun dies uh, and it bolsters the alliance, then, yeah, you aren't really doing anything for yourself there. So, I, I like the dilemma. I, I really do. You know me, I love my good old moral dilemmas. Haven't, uh... Haven't done anything involving those in a while, so this is kind of refreshing to hear in a historical context. So he just sits around at a local temple for several years. Thus, in a world where hostages are slaughtered left and right, this boy is left unharmed until, at last, an opportunity comes for the Oda to get what little use out of him they can. The old head of the Oda has died, and the Oda forces are in a bit of disarray. The Imagawa see their opportunity and put to siege the castle that houses the new head of the Oda clan while he's relatively undefended. Hmm. Then they offer the Oda a deal. We'll let you live if you hand over the castle we're sieging and give us back the Matsudaira boy you stole from us years ago. The Oda jump at the deal because, hey, good riddance. The head of the Matsudaira clan has also just recently died, making this boy, in name at least, the new head of the clan. The Imagawa Ooh. see having him as a hostage as a good way of assuring that the Matsudaira will remain on their side. And with any luck, they can raise him to be a staunch ally of the Imagawa by the time he returns home at the age of 15. In 1556, the boy is now officially a man by the standards of the time, and he returns to Mikawa to rule the province in his own right. Okay, it, and I it makes me wonder what this guy's role is going to be going forward i i feel some dramatic irony being built up here that i can't exactly predict i have a feeling and i like to predict these things ahead of time just to see how well i know human nature and often when i'm getting into cultures that i'm not familiar with my instincts are wrong but i assume that the way that this is being presented this guy is going to uh 
take over at least one of the sides. That that that's my guess. That's my long term guess. We'll see how it goes. The alliance with the Imagawa is going well. The Oda are feeling the pressure. One of the other major sides Lachidama are going to fall to him. Imagawa. And now it is time for this teenage daimyo to take up the sword himself and lead the Matsudaira forces. His capacity for war is quickly confirmed as he storms through Oda lands, reducing the hill forts along the border. But I'm even so as his armies are raising the Matsudaira boy. flag over these fortified hills, the Imagawa forces are doing even better, cutting deep swaths into the Oda lands. The end is near. The Imagawa forces are going to march on to the final great Oda castle, destroy their last major rival, and sweep on to take Kyoto, with the loyal Matsudaira at their side. The Imagawa forces are resting in a gorge, partying, celebrating, and regathering their strength for the final siege of this castle. The Matsudaira forces are camped a bit further off at one of the border forts they've recently taken. Meanwhile, the last of the Oda forces are in their castle. They are preparing for one last desperate defense, but their leader, the 26-year-old Oda Nobunaga, has other plans. His advisors counsel him to hide in the castle, or perhaps to surrender without a fight. But he turns to them and he says, Do you really want to spend your entire lives praying for longevity? We were born in order to die. Whoever's with me, come to the battlefield Dude. tomorrow morning. Whoever's not, just stay wherever you are and watch me win it. What a chat. He knows that all defending the castle will do is buy him maybe a few more days, but he has no interest in losing more slowly. He'd rather take the thousand to one shot at victory. So he... I kind of hope he wins now. Like, I'm ju I'm jumping from side to side here because really I have no, no uh, cultural understanding here or any allegiance. I, I guess whoever is the biggest Chad, I, I guess I... I'm really wanting to win at this case, so now I kind of want him to win. Uh, I I have no I have no sense of consistency here. The th interesting thing about this one, I I still find myself a little bit lost. I feel like in the other extra history videos I've watched so far, when you do the first one, they spend so much more time uh, building the groundwork and setting up kind of the the context around things and it feels like they did that so quickly here and they're jumping straight into the action unless what's going on right now isn't like as big of a deal compared to what we're going to see it feels like they're approaching this a little bit differently from how they approach a lot of their other videos i don't know if it's just a difference between covering eastern and western stuff and maybe there's something there i i'm, I'm not really sure but he gathers up the few hundred men he has in his castle and begins riding toward the Imagawa force, an army that numbers in the tens of thousands. He rallies men to his banner as he winds through the countryside, mustering a force of about 2,500 souls not afraid to die on this not suicide bad. charge he's proposing. But his information network is still good, and he knows that the Imagawa forces are resting in a gorge. What's more, it's a gorge he knows well from when he was a boy. He has a plan. It may be a desperate one, perhaps even a foolhardy one, but it is a plan. He has no intention of charging onto the spears of his enemies just to die with glory. Okay, when good, near good. Near the gorge where his enemies are resting, Oda Nobunaga does something that seems like madness with his force of 2,500 facing up against an army of 25,000. He splits up his men. But he's playing to win here, and he knows that he's only got one shot. So he sends a division of 500 men up to a fortified temple on a nearby hill. These 500 men are not there to fight, but rather to create a decoy army. They take flags huh. and banners and litter them atop the hill so that the men in the gorge think that Nobunaga's entire force has taken up a defensive position there. Hardly a threat for them to worry about. After all, it's just... Okay, for a second I thought they were going to do the thing where they pretend that the army is bigger than it is, which I've seen done in many other cases where, like, they somehow set things up that makes it look like the army is way bigger so that the enemy force isn't as enthusiastic about attacking, but... It, it, they're just straight up decoying, it seems. One more hill fort to take. But Oda Nobunaga has another plan. He what is your another plan? He knows how to sneak around the gorge and enter it from a place that Imagawa will never suspect. As he begins to lead his forces around their stealthy path, a storm rolls in. The rain begins to pour. The clouds and the water whipping through the wind mask his approach. No one in the gorge sees them until it's too late. The men in the gorge have been drinking. Some are in tents. Many have dispersed to find shelter from the rain. And then, just as the clouds part and the rain stops, Oda Nobunaga's men come charging into the valley. It's mayhem. It's a slaughter. The unprepared and drunken men scatter or fall where they stand. The attack is so sudden that the lord of the Imagawa doesn't even realize it's an attack. He thinks it's just a ruckus caused by the peasants and his army, so he doesn't That's move funny. from the play he's watching until a soldier bursts into his tent. 
At first, he thinks it's one of his men, but the soldier thrusts a spear at him. Oh, he whips no. out his katana at the Poor last guy. moment and slices the spear in two. Or not, I don't know. Another man rushes in and lops off his head. With that, with such oh, surprise dude. and such panic, with the complete loss of their leadership, the Imagawa army evaporates. Oh, military stuff in the East is so cool. I mean, I know we have swords and stuff, but like in in, in like European history or whatever, and that that that's great and all, but there's something so. I, I guess because I associate it with a lot of the fantasy stuff that I've read or watched, uh, I, I, I guess it just feels so unreal the way because because it's so culturally foreign to me that it, it really does feel like fantasy, which I think is really cool. Um, I, I I I've recently found that I'm. The further back you go, the more I'm into how the military stuff works. Uh, the modern stuff with all, all the technology and whatever, that it, it's really impressive and stuff. But for some reason, me, as somebody who's not really militarily minded, I somehow connect more with like kind of the, the really old stuff. And this isn't even that old in the grand scheme of things. I thought this was going to be further back. I, what did they say? This is like the 1500s? It started in the 1400s, ended in the 1500s so far? Thousands are cut down as they flee. Thousands more just quietly return to their farms back in the Imagawa lands. But this force was everything. The Imagawa thought they were going all the way to Kyoto with this army, so they brought everything they had. The weakened Imagawa are now just carrion for their hungry neighbors. All of those clans around them descend on their land and carve it up between them. Even one of their former allies. The young leader of the Matsudaira understood which way the wind was blowing. As he watched the routing Imagawa forces stream past his mm. captured hill fort, he decided that it was time to meet with the young lord of the Oda. Oda Nobunaga, perhaps due to his own lack of forces, or perhaps due to the Matsudaira boy's nearly mythical ability to dodge death, agreed to work with him rather than slaughter his forces outright, as was often done to the losing side during the Sengoku Jidai. Okay. The young Matsudaira leader agreed to be not perhaps a vassal, but more a junior partner in wherever Nobunaga's adventures may lead him. This young man who I sense betrayal coming. Wide, we'll see. Tokugawa Ieyasu. Join us for the next episode as Oda Nobunaga begins to formulate his oh, own I like plans their, I like their things. Kyoto, and their this young outfits. man transforms the Matsudaira into the formidable Tokugawa clan. Oh, and if you want some more cool samurai effects, check out this video from our friends at All Time Numbers. See you next time. Is that it? All right. That that's really cool. Um I'm kind of glad that I picked this because it, it's very exciting. Still difficult. I felt like only towards the end was I starting to like match the names to what was going on. I, I, I guess that's something I've always kind of struggled with, with uh, Japanese names in particular. I've, I've learned this in... Uh, I watch a lot of Japanese wrestling and it took a long time for me to know every to match names to faces with with like the big wrestlers or whatever and and i i guess i, I don't know if it's if it's just because the the language is so different from what i'm used to it just seems like a vowel and consonant soup to me for a while and then i need to really get used to it that that's probably the case but this is already really exciting and i want to hopefully do these pretty often because i feel like if i take significant breaks in between these videos i'm going to forget a lot of the names and whatever and it's gonna be a little harder to keep up with so i'm gonna try to get another one of these out in the next like maybe four days four or five days um uh, like hopefully less than a week so uh, yeah, that was cool. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I really had a lot of fun with it. I, it's different. It's very different from what I do. Um, so like this video if you like this video. Leave me suggestions for the next uh, series you want me to check out. Or I could just keep going down the playlist and do them in order like I've been doing. I, I'm actually not really sure how. I kind of like the idea of doing them in order because it constantly makes me check out new things not always the most popular things sometimes the more obscure things and i'm kind of cool with that as well so i'm not completely decided so we'll fit we'll figure it out all right like comment subscribe and become a channel member there is a link to do so in the description box below all right that's about it thank you guys and i will see you next time later